Then drop some off. Well, good morning. Good morning. We've spread out a little bit since break, and I think that's okay. So I'll just have to talk a little bit louder. If that works. Do you have a yellow piece of paper with you? I'd like to make a couple recommendations on the back. Uh, if you look at the bottom, there's a lot of books that are listed there. And uh, the third one down is Hurt 2.0. The inside the world of today's teenagers. Just some great observations and insights. Now, if you look down right about in the middle of the list, a Sticky Faith Youth Workers Edition. This, uh, well, this one here, I think, is the Matt's copy. It's pretty dog eared, it's been used pretty well. But again, just a lot of good insights. If you're looking to take what you received this morning and put it into a little more uh, depth. And then there's a Sticky Faith launch kit. This is really for church, but I think a lot of the principles would be applicable in release time. It's uh, your next 180 days. What are the things that you can start implementing uh, in the days to come? So if you're looking for some specific resources, you can do that. Now, if you want uh, some things that you could get online or maybe get a weekly email or something like that, my wife receives from the Fuller Youth Institute just a weekly update that they send. So if you went to fulleryouthinstitute.org, uh, the web page, you can sign up for those things there, fulleryouthinstitute.org. Well, I'm, I'm glad really to be here today uh, with you, and I, I look forward kind of the annual gatherings where we get to talk together, kind of think a little bit about what the Lord's going to do and how He's going to do it. We've learned some good things this morning that, well, as, as I sat back and, and listened again today, I, I just realized kind of the immensity of the work that we have to do. But I think what a privilege it is, too, right? Uh, the kids are really wanting us to be real, real with them and authentic with them. Uh, we, we just can't do a fancy little program, hope to show up and hope it's going to do something, hope to work. And so what kids are really helping us to do is grow and to develop and even become better ourselves. Isn't that pretty exciting? <laughs> now, why, why are you laughing a little bit? Because you don't want to grow and become better or develop or, or because of the hard work that's involved. Yeah, yeah. It's not always easy, is it? Well, I think, though, as we're here and we have this opportunity to do this, we really need to think about what a privilege it is that we have to do this, to be able to minister to children. I've observed a few things about myself over the years in ministry, and particularly when it comes to my opinions about things, whether it be in ministry or other aspects of life. Uh, one of the things that I know is the stronger that I am committed to something, the more likely I am to share my opinion about it. Have you ever found this to be true with anybody? Now, I, I thought that I'd spend the first 15 minutes today talking about politics, but then I thought again, because I didn't think that would be really helpful, right? Uh, I thought, though, I'd maybe tell you about two restaurants that I eat at for just a little bit. Uh, we've got this place in, in Greencastle. It's uh, the morning place that I go to. And I'll tell you, I go there because it's convenient in my path. The food's okay. The service is subpar. But other than that, it's convenient for me. I've been there probably, well, I don't know, 9 or 10 years. The restaurant I used to go to, the guy retired and closed it down. I used to like that place because after the third time that I was there, the waitress, her name was Tracy. Now, this is 12 and a half years ago. Tracy got to know my name, and any time I came in, she'd call me by name. Uh, she quickly learned what I ordered. And i got to tell you, this place where I've been going since, sometimes I'll wear my name tag in, in hopes, <laughs> in hopes that they'll at least call me by name. It is, can you read it back there? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty big, isn't it? You'd think from this far apart. Now, there's one waitress. Her name is Deb. Deb will call me by name, whether I have my name tag on or not. That's pretty good. Deb remembers that I pretty much get the same thing all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of nice when I come in and she'll just bring it out to me. And, and you know, for those of you who don't know, what I usually get all the time is oatmeal. Okay? <laughs> Healthy, good for you oatmeal. And every once in a while if I come in, if I think, oh, maybe I'm not going to do oatmeal today, if Deb's serving me, uh, she's going to help me out. She's just going to bring it to me. And I don't even get it with brown sugar. I only get cinnamon. Isn't that healthy? Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, well, uh, why do I eat there? Because it's convenient, not because I'm really excited about it. I gotta tell you, there's this other restaurant that I'll go to, that I'll even drive out of the way to go to, because uh, I'll eat there. It's called Chick-fil-A. Any of you ever been to a, a Chick-fil-A? I mean, I, I'd love to tell you about some of my recent experiences there, because they've been so good. 
Uh, but I won't take all the time to do it. How many of you have ever had a good experience there with service or food or things like that? You know that. So I love to tell people about the good experience I've had and the things that I've learned. It just makes it so much better. Well, I'll tell you what else I do sometimes. And I haven't done this for quite a long time. Uh, but I like to share my opinions uh, when I go to football games. Any of you ever done something like this? Uh, anyone know someone who's done something like this? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. You know. Uh, should I ask you who? No, no, no. I'm an official. You're an official? Oh, no. Well, the next story that I'd like to tell is... Uh, <laughs> what's that? Everybody tells me you're I'm going to tell you another one then. So, <laughs> so here's mine. I, when I was younger, my, my dad, mom, my, my grandparents had season tickets to the Minnesota Vikings. Now, if you, if you don't know who they are, they're a professional football team, and uh, they, they, they play uh, in Minnesota. So we would go to these games, okay? And, uh, well, when I was younger, I had this dream of being an opera singer. Why? Because, well, there's some gifts that I've been given that I could do this. So here's what I learned. The refs, you know, sometimes they made bad calls, right? Does that happen? Oh, okay. <laughs> You're still employed, are you, as a ref? <laughs> okay, so sometimes they make bad calls. And, you know, everyone likes to boo at the same time. But here's what I learned. You see, our seats were 17 rows up, definitely within the range of my voice. So I would wait until there would be a lull in, in the action, and it would be quiet. And I'd say so. Now, with all due respect, I, I maintained my Christian faith in the midst of this, but I would say something to let them know of my displeasure. And I knew that my point had gotten across, and the refs were usually really good, but I knew when my point got across when the head would turn just a little bit to see, where did that come from, you know? But then about that same time, it didn't matter where my mom was sitting, I mean, she could have been, you know, six chairs over. Somehow, her arm and hand made it right to my shoulder. And, and these, you know, you've seen these fingers, moms, any of you have them? You know, they just kind of anchor in and grip and leave a mark for the rest of the game. And, and I, sometimes I knew that was coming, but well, when you think about boldness, and I really wanted to share these things, you know, I, boldness isn't hesitating or being fearful in, in, in case of any type of actual or possible danger or rebuff, whether it be courageous or daring in any type of way. And so I knew I still did those kind of things, even though I knew my mom might do this to me. Well, I can tell you that was definitely when I was younger. It was a long time ago, and I haven't shared it at any type of game like that. Now, I might think some of these things, and, you know, but I, I won't holler them out anymore. Aren't you thankful? Yeah. <laughs> so. But how many other times have the Lord given us opportunities, perhaps, to be bold with people? Maybe to say something to someone, to confront them on something, to bring truth in a way that would help them realize there's something that they need to hear. Uh, and there can be good ways, too, that we definitely need to be bold. In addition to that, offering to play, pray. And you know, sometimes I'll eat with fellow believers in restaurants, and I realize they probably don't normally pray in public. Well, the same place where I go to quite regularly to eat, I came in one morning, and before I sat down, three different people from one of the waitresses to several others came to me and said, hey, you know, one of them said, we know you're a praying man. Would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? I've been given opportunities to pray in a variety of places. And sometimes, you know, even when you pray publicly, you wonder, well, how much can I pray in the name of Jesus or do things that are called generic do I need to be? Let me tell you, the bolder we are, the more people seem to respond get opportunities quite often to speak at our local, not speak, to pray at our local <coughs> school board meeting. They do this during open comment time because anyone can give in a comment during that. It's fully legal. And, and what starts happening now is people, as I come in, board members and others kind of, hey, could you pray for, could you pray for, could you pray for? And, and they're inviting us into this process. There's great opportunities to be bold. And I imagine that for many of you, you've been given many times where you can think, you know what, I'm not going to hesitate. I'm not going to be fearful. There might be some kind of concern, but I'm not going to be worried with this. I'm going to be bold. I mean, we've seen in our culture where someone not too long ago decided, I'm not baking this cake, and they were slapped with a $135,000 fine because they weren't going to do that. You know, there's still things that we consider that will take boldness as we need to think through them. 
Oftentimes when we talk to school officials and say, hey, can we distribute this brochure? Can we be at this open house? Can we go to this place? Can we do these things? Sometimes I'll be like, ah, I'd rather not. And it will take boldness on our part to keep opening the door, to keep communicating, to keep talking, and to do it in a winsome and compelling manner, but not to easily give up and, and to let it go. Some very, very valuable things. Now, why would we want to do this? I mean, why would we want to be bold with people? You know, why would I want to pray in public? Oh, why would I want to you know, invite perhaps someone to, to hear some truth about their life? Why would we want to go and distribute brochures even though a school official might be a little uncomfortable? I think it's because of this, simply this, this very, very basic belief that life is hopeless without Jesus Christ and children need the hope of Jesus. I mean, if me saying something or not saying something is going to open the door for a child, well then let's say it. Let's take a risk and do something. You see, this isn't that much different than what the Lord did a few thousand years ago. Uh, the church, in fact, began as a movement. It was a launch around an event in history. The resurrection of Jesus. Now the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ galvanized this group of people in such a way that they really believed that Jesus was who he said he was, that he did what he said he did, and because of that, they began themselves as a movement. Now here's what we know about movements. They actually move. You know, they go from one place to the next. They're living, growing, and vibrant. And this last year in some of our release times, we really saw some significant movement occur. And as I'm looking into this next year, I'm really hopeful and excited that more and more movement is going to occur. And why is this so valuable? Well, children, right, they're hopeless without Jesus, and they need the hope that Jesus Christ can bring to them. If you have your Bibles and you want to look with me to Acts chapter 5, I'd like to just dig in a little bit and look at this movement that was occurring. Acts chapter 5, where we really see the church beginning and developing and coming into place. Well, Acts chapter 5, we start with verse 12. We read, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. I mean, you get the idea. This is a pretty compelling environment, pretty attractive. I mean, people are bringing people, those who needed help, those who needed healing, in just the hopes that Peter's shadow might fall on him. I mean, could you imagine the day when the kids are just bringing kids just in the hopes that they might hear some of the teaching, they might get to see this listener, they might get to feel the love that's felt there? Could you think about this? I mean, and you know what's happening now, right? So the kids who are coming because of the love they receive, some of the care that they receive, and then they're going to start bringing their friends to do this. I mean, this is that concept. Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Like, this is pretty vibrant stuff, some pretty exciting things that are happening. Now, verse 17, what, what happens, by the way, when God starts doing some amazing things? What often happens when God starts doing some work? Have you ever seen spiritual warfare occur? Have you ever seen the evil one want to shut things down? Ooh, we, we can talk about stories, right? It's like, ooh, things are really happening. All of a sudden, oh, the school says, oh, we're changing your time. The school says, oh, you can't do this. Uh, parents start calling and say, you know what? My kid's missing out on math. Can't come anymore. I mean, these things come about. These are spiritual issues really at root. Verse 17, then the high priests and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Hmm. That's that sinful nature, right, that rubs inside us? Because these guys had had it for a while. Everyone was kind of listening to them, following them, and all of a sudden, it's happening over here. 
Something's going on over here, and they're a little jealous about this. So what are they going to do? Well, they use their authority, uh, and they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Not a good sign, is it? But because this is a spiritual thing, not just a physical thing, God worked through this. So <laughs> verse 19, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. So at daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. Then the high priest and his associates arrived. They called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. No, it was a problem. They were there. Well, they didn't realize this quite yet. So, so look at this here. Uh, they, they sent to the jail for the apostles. Verse 22. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and they reported. They're giving them their checklist. You know, we found the jail securely locked. Check. Good. They did that. With the guards standing at the doors. Check. You know, they did that. <laughs> but, now, you know, you hear that word, it's never good, right? It's never good there. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. <laughs> On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering, eh, what's going to come of this? Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. What? I thought they put them in jail thinking they're going to solve this problem. So at that, the captain with his officers went and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. They saw the attraction. They saw what was going on with these people who were following them and watching them. Verse 27, having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. So Peter and the other apostles replied, you're right, we'll stop doing it. <laughs> no. <laughs> they said we must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than men. How many times have we faced a situation like this? Where we've had to obey God rather than man. You see, we're living in a culture, really, in a time in our history where we've had a lot of safety. We've had a lot of comfort. Yet we pray what I call kind of a lot of anemic prayers. Like, oh, you know, Lord, keep us safe. Oh, just keep everything fine. Yet we realize there's these spiritual battles going on. And what a lot of this comfort has led us to, and as Andy Stanley would say, we have become some of the least bold believers in the world. Well, why, why not? Why haven't we been bolder? You know, there aren't always a lot of needs to be bold, and we don't always envision them as that. About two and a half years ago, the Lord opened up the door for me to start traveling to a foreign country and uh, to be able to basically equip and teach leaders to do Christian camp ministry. A lot of the things that we do at Joy Health to release time in other ways. Well, here's the thing. I don't go there. I can't go there with like a religious instructor's uh, visa because they won't give me one of those. So I go in as a tourist. In fact, one of the last times I went, uh, a friend of mine who, who's over there, he said, by the way, a bunch of Americans were just here. They weren't Christians, but they were in on uh, tourist visas as well, and they were just teaching kind of to some non-governmental organizations and they were found out, they were held in jail for a while, and they were sent back. Just to be prepared. And I thought, do I tell my wife this now, or do I wait till after I come back, you know? No, let's tell her now so she can be praying. You see, as we get these opportunities to be bold, then we start seeing the Lord show up. We start seeing the Lord kind of come along, like, whoo, we'll do a little bit more. We'll take a few more steps, and we'll start acting a little bit way. Well, see, the people on the outside were looking at that local church, that developing movement, with great awe. I mean, they were gaining great favor in the community. But in a lot of ways, because of our blessings, because of our comfort, 
we have lost some of these things. But I think we need the opportunity to kind of amp up our boldness just a few steps today. So Peter and the other apostles replied, you know what? We need to obey God, not man. So verse 30 says, The God of our fathers, who has raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now when they heard this, they're furious. And they wanted to put him to death. And they weren't sure what were they going to do. Well, come, Gamaliel comes in and he says, listen, here's what I've seen over history. All these people have kind of come up. They, they've risen in prominence. And they've got these movements. 400 followed here. Others followed these others. And they just kind of died off. So, so here's the thing. If these guys are really following God, and if this movement is really from God, there's nothing that you can do to stop it. But if it's not of God, don't worry about it. It's just going to fall apart. <clears throat> so, and, and this is really what we see. Verse 39, but if this is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Now here's the exciting thing. In release time, we can be bold because we're doing what the Lord wants us to do in following His great commission. We are doing this in His strength and in His power. So verse 40 says, Gamaliel's speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them again not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles, it says, left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Do you think the last time you have rejoiced because of the suffering that you've received for counting disgrace for his name? Do you think it was the last time? Like, it doesn't happen that much, does it? In our country, we've been pretty protected. What might it be, what might happen that might bring something for that? Well, here's what it says, verse 42. It says, day after day, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. And I tell you what, that's passion. That's boldness. Like, they knew the hopelessness of life without Jesus, and they saw the great connection that could occur as they came into contact with Jesus. We've been so blessed in so many ways. We've been so comforted. So comfortable. But what we need to do, really, is to keep fixing our eyes on the Lord. So how do we increase our boldness? And I'm not talking about harshness. I'm talking, not talking about combativeness. I'm talking about boldness. How do we increase this? There's, there's four things I'd like to share with us today that I think that we can do to do this. Number one it is to remember that life is hopeless without Jesus Christ. And children need the hope of Jesus. Like, we do release time because we want to be able to, in this environment, this loving environment, share with children, here is Jesus, a guy who loved you so much he wanted to come in a relationship with you. And we recognize that every child that comes has the opportunity to hear this. Like, this is what continues to motivate me when we see how these children can connect with the Lord through release time. I mean, and this is what Jesus really wanted to do, Luke 19.10. It says, he came to seek and to save those who were lost. It's getting intimately involved with the needs of children. I mean, this is going to move our hearts. I can tell you what, the more involved that I get with the needs of children, the more that my heart feels heavy. The more that it's weighed down. But what encourages and what lifts it up is when you see step by step, little by little, students growing, learning, and kind of having those eyes of hope open as they connect with the Lord. And if we really believe this, if we really believe that the hopelessness of life without Jesus, well, we're going to go to great lengths to ensure that children are invited and they're going to want to attend and they're going to want to grow. 
Well, secondly, we, we need to make sure that we keep fixing our eyes on Jesus, uh, not really the intimidating problem. And, and we have that, right? Transportation, well, we don't have enough transportation. We don't have enough volunteers. We don't have enough space. We don't have enough of that. We don't, I mean, could we come up with a list of problems? We could close my session now and just talk about problems, if that'd be helpful. That would be helpful, would it? Because how many do you think we'll have? And sometimes our boldness is going to evidence itself in the midst of this. But Hebrews 12, too, you know, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him despised the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, and in your striving against sin, for you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Like, any, any of you shed blood yet in, in, in this whole release time endeavor? I mean, maybe you fall on their trip or something like that, but like, anyone been shot at going into the school office because you're bringing in brochures or permission forms? You know, maybe you've received those evil eye looks every once in a while or something like that. But you see what I'm saying? Like, just keep fixing it on him. Because what do we find when we do this? Not only an example, but strength and empowerment that's going to move us and compel us forward. In verse chapter, chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats. What a great prayer, right? As we think of Jesus. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. I have two wristbands on my arm. The green one matches my shirt, but that wasn't intentional. And the black one simply says this, Be bold, Acts 4.29. Got it in church about two and a half months ago after sermon. It's a constant prayer to remind myself, you know, I can't do this on my own. But it's through fixing on him, looking at him. Because we're going to have problems every day. I mean, quite honestly, some days i got to be bold with my kids at home even before I get out of the house in the morning. Uh, I could just stop right there. But there's going to be opportunities regularly. Now, how many of you know we can't do this on our own? We just can't. It's through the Lord's strength that we can do this. Number three is we must be connected to God through prayer. Well, we need to be connected to him through prayer. Psalm 138, 3, when I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. Another translation would say, you made me bold with strength in my soul. It's kind of that spiritual infusion that we can't do anything about on our own, but the Lord just brings it in, fills it, and enables us to do these things that we need to do. You know, John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can just do a little bit. No, no. no. How much? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know if you've ever tried to do it on your own. I have numerous times. And it doesn't work very well, does it? Defeat, discouragement, things like this. I tell you what, even when I have a strength, sometimes I feel a little defeated, discouragement, but it just keeps coming in well enough. And that's what we need to be remaining connected to him through prayer. In the 1950s in Argentina, it was a spiritual wasteland. If you've done any reading, you can see this. And of course, according to Dr. Edward Miller, he was a missionary who spent four decades there in Argentina. He said in 1950, there were only about 600 spirit-filled believers in the entire country. In his book, Cry, Me for Argentina, Cry for Me, Argentina, he describes the genesis of a revival that started in Argentina and swept across South America. It began with 50 students at the Argentine Bible Institute who developed an intense prayer burden for all of the nation of Argentina. Dr. Miller said that he had never seen people weep so hard or pray so long. Day after day, they wept and prayed, and after hours of intercession, students would literally be standing in their own puddle of tears. On the 50th day of around-the-clock intercession, there was a word, Weep no more, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed over the prince of Argentina. Eighteen months later, hundreds of thousands of Argentines were flocking to crusades at soccer stadiums. The largest stadiums, which could seat 180,000 people, 
weren't large enough to handle the crowds that were coming. And Dr. Miller came to this conclusion. He said, if God can get enough people in an area to reject the rulership and dominion of Satan, if enough of his people will reject Satan's dominion the right way, with humility and brokenness and a repentant intercession, then God's going to slap an eviction notice on the doorway of this ruling demonic power of that area. And when he does, there's a light and a glory that begins to come in. See, we don't know how or when or where a move of God might begin. But if we hit our knees and pray, God's going to extend his, his mighty right hand on our behalf. If we lay a foundation of prayer, God will build something spectacular on top of it. If we intercede like we have never, or if we, inter, if we intercede like never before, God's going to intervene like never before. Here's one of the things I can tell you that's been consistent at all release times where we've seen major, major significant is there is a concentration of prayer that goes well beyond that time when they gather together there. Uh, sometimes it's taken multiple years for this really to occur. Uh, and I'm not talking about we're gathering together and we're praying for you know, the sister brothers who's got cancer and this and that. Those are valuable things, but I'm talking about we're praying specifically for the advancement, for the movement of the gospel. We're praying by name for these children that are back there that we know need to come. We're praying and claiming God's promises over them and seeing the Lord work over that. I tell you what, I've, I've been to a lot of release times over the years, and I can always tell, I can always see when the Spirit of God is at work in there and when He's not. You know, when He's not, division. It could be division among those who are there. It could be division with them and leaders above them. It could be division with them. And like sometimes we've got churches that are at war and they try to come together and pretend that they could do ministry and they go back to their war. Each. When that's gone, when the Spirit of the Lord works, the gospel moves. Prayer is one of the biggest ways to increase our boldness. Finally, number four, just plain old ask God for boldness. Proverbs 28 once says, The wicked man flees, though, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so let me talk about some baby steps here for boldness, if I could. Number one, bold is deciding to say something when it would be easier to say nothing. Yeah, I think we're on the neck, yeah. Uh, it's deciding to say something when it would be easier to say nothing. In Minnesota, where I grew up, we have what's called Minnesota Nice. That means we're nice to your face, and when you leave, we'll say what we really wanted to say to somebody else. Uh, but what we're saying is, you might need to say real nicely, boldly to them, when you think, eh, probably easier not to. Number two, bold is taking advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. Here's what I've learned. Rarely do opportunities present themselves twice. Well, here's an opportunity. I could say something. I could say something. I was just talking to my wife during the break. She called and said, I just want to let you know she was out to breakfast with several ladies this morning. This lady came in, and she just started talking from someone that she kind of knew. And uh, as an end result, the lady was signing up her son for release time in a nearby school. And, and, and Stephanie felt, do I, don't I want to step up from the table where I'm at to talk to her? I, I really need to. Who would have known the Lord would have led the conversation that way? Take, you know, take advantage of these opportunities when they come up to be able to do this. Boldness is also creating opportunities. Now, sometimes we've got to be a little unique and creative in how we can get in to share some things. Boldness is praying for students by name. Uh, let's get lists of names. Sometimes just asking the kids, who are some of your friends back here? Who are some of the friends back there? Sometimes schools give the lists. It depends in different scenarios. But let's just pray for them by name and see what the Lord reveals. I, I can tell you what, I, I've had numerous times over this last year where I've sensed like I need to pray for someone and, and, and if I have it in my context, I'll just shoot them a text and say, I don't know, the Lord just really impressed me to pray for you right now and just wanted to let you know that. So often someone will come back and say, here's what I was thinking about. Here's what I was wrestling with or here's what I was about to do. Responding specifically to these things. Sometimes it might be stepping up and doing a bigger role. Maybe you've been, uh, for quite a long time, uh, you have been um, uh, serving as a listener. You might think, maybe I should teach. Uh, probably not. If the Lord's putting that thought in your mind, let's, let's, let's play it out. Let's see what's happening. Uh, maybe I should be a coordinator. Maybe I should go and plant a new one. There's a school that doesn't have one. Maybe I should go plant this. What could that look like? 
Maybe you're going to hand out permission forms on school sidewalks. Maybe you're going to do it multiple times. Because if you do it multiple times, they'll start seeing you and they'll start recognizing you. And the kids who know you will say, oh, that's who that is. That's who that is. And the kid who might not take it the first time, might not take it the second time, might take it the third time. Now, that'd be bold. Or maybe it would be talking with a school official. Maybe it's about something touching. But maybe it's just about, hey, how can I pray for you? I mean, who doesn't? Uh, there, there's a few people. But most people really like to be prayed for. Most people like to know that you're praying for them. Just keep asking children again and again and again and again. Keep going where children are to connect with them. Go where parents are to connect with them. And then share the opportunity everywhere you can, however you can. I mean, if you don't have brochures in your pockets, put them in your purse. If you don't have them in your purse, just carry them around because you never know where you might be that you could say to someone or give to someone because they might know someone. You know what I'm talking about? Any of you ever done this? Some of you have done this? Some of you don't want to carry around brochures with you? <laughs> well, it's a good thing to do. Just try it. Try it. If you carry it around for a whole year and no one ever comes up in conversation, talk to me next year and I'll pray for you specifically by name every day. The Lord will bring someone to you. Just try it. <clears throat> the Lord said, we looked at this, uh, or the, Peter said, And now, Lord, Acts 4, 29, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. So how did this movement kind of, at least the description of it, end in Acts? Acts 28, 30 and 31 says, Two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, they preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the NIV. Here's what the NAS says Pre, uh, for 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and, and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. That's the last word of the book of Acts. Now I threw that in since yesterday because Matt said, hey, you know your Greek. The last Greek word in the Old Testament of Acts is unhindered. Can you think what it would be like to do our ministry unhindered? We've been given this great opportunity to trust in the Lord, to follow Him, to live Him in 19, or 1857, Jeremiah Lamphere went to New York City as a missionary. And the Lord led him to start praying with a group of men. The first day they prayed, six men started praying. Well, this multiplied next week, 14, and it continued to multiply. Over a variety of years, the Lord started bringing revival. And about 6,100 some men were meeting over the lunch hour every day. It was reported at that time about 10,000 people a week were coming to the Lord. About one-tenth of a percent of the population of New York City at that time. Can you, do you think those first six, that first day that they met, might have felt discouraged at all? There's just six meeting this day. You know, they're a part of history. They're part of writing history, not even knowing that they're part of that. And then looking back many years later to see, here's who we are, and here's what we're part of. We have no idea what the Lord's going to do. Many of you have been in this for a while. You've seen how kids have grown and developed, and the Lord has used that. We have no idea what the Lord is going to do. Wouldn't it be great if we could say, without hindrance, we keep preaching this kingdom of God and, and talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come here to be in your presence, to continue to look at and see what can we do to find strength from you, how can we find just the sustenance that we need to be bold and strong-hearted? Oh, Lord, we pray that you'll continue to do this, that you'll continue to give us words to say when we're not sure we should say them, but that you'll continue to allow us opportunities to create, that you'll continue to allow us to connect with children so that we can share with them the hope of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray for those who are here today, for those who weren't able to be here, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would empower them to do your work. Lord, we commission them as your people, your servants, who are going out to share with these people in these communities your great love. Lord, may they be your ambassadors, bringing your message of reconciling hope that will change the eternity that will change the, the direction of the lives of these children. We praise you, Lord, thanking you that you give us strength and you give us power to do this. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Well, it's been so good having you here today. Gary, do you have any final instructions?